Coming up on the Preacher Boys podcast. You think you've seen an increase? You ain't seen nothing yet. You stand on the brink of a great yacht, Pacananina, Pelevena, the Bruce Stone, Rebel, and Menania. Ha ha. So calling in a Melevena, and Melevan, Bramban, Denabun, Gulliba. The Spirit of God. There's angels walking up down these aisles right now, handing out gifts. My parents had gotten very heavily involved in the spiritual revival movement known as the Toronto Blessing. And that was like very holy roller, casting out demons, performing miracles, praying in tongues, having visions. It was a very demonstrative, emotive, almost psychedelic experience of faith. When Alice Gretchen turned 11, her parents felt called by God to give up their home and worldly employment for heavenly provision. They followed their faith into homelessness with five children and a cat in tow. Homeschooled and avowed never to kiss a man until her wedding day, Alice had plans to escape the instability by becoming a missionary nurse. Plans that were put on hold with the opening of an unexpected door, the opportunity to be an actress in Hollywood. What followed was a test of faith unlike any she had prepared for, an arranged betrothal she never saw coming, and a psychological shattering that forced her to learn how to survive without the only framework for life she had ever known. Her book, Wayward, is a coming-of-age story that takes place within a Christian subculture that teaches children to be martyrs and women to be silent. Her powerful memoir is available in both print and in audiobook format, and you can purchase your copy by visiting the link in the show notes of this episode. Now, let's get into my conversation with Alice Gretchen. Alice, thank you so much for joining me. Yes, thank you so much for having me, Eric. It's a pleasure to be here. I think we might be like, second cousins or something because you pointed out uh, we both have the Polish name and you're the CZYN, which I guess is rare. And you used to be CZYN SKI, which is super, super close. That's the family rumors that my last name used to be Gryczynski. And I would pronounce your last name Sparczynski, but... (laughs) Which is probably right. (laughs) Yeah. I, w- I was saying um, right before we hit record, I met someone from Poland and they gave me that pronunciation, which I'm not going to even attempt. And I was like, look, we've been saying Skorzynski for like three generations now. I think we'll just keep this one going. But uh, why did your family shorten the name? What's wrong with like 10 letters? I know, right? Like it's not complicated enough. So <laughs> um, no, I, I really don't know, to be honest with you, but I know it must have happened a while back. Um, before the 1900s. So uh, just judging by Ellis Island and other immigration documentation that I've been lucky to have access to. But um, but yeah, it's just Gretchen. People are always uh, intimidated to try, as I'm sure they are with your name too. I've got Greasy, Grexine, Grexian. Um, and it's like, no, just like the girl's first name, just Gretchen. Um, and then when I tell them, think of the Czech Republic, it kind of makes sense to them. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Gre- at least Gretchen is a familiar name, so you can like throw it out there. But yeah, Greason doesn't sound so great. I would stick away from that, <laughs> that pronunciation. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I, in addition to talking about our heritage, um, I also really resonate with your upbringing. And um, I came across you through a little bit culty, which I just happened to be wearing this. I didn't even think of the connection. but. Um, but yeah, it was really interesting because we both grew up in very religious backgrounds, um, however, different denominations. And so the paint on the exterior of the religious upbringing is very different. You know, music that you probably were allowed to listen to, we definitely weren't, or services may have looked a little bit different, but when you get to the nuts and bolts and the shame and the fears, and especially the purity culture element, like there is so much as I was reading through your book that just felt so similar. And I know for my audience, they're going to feel a lot of those similarities as well. But I I guess to kind of start building the foundation, your parents were already religious when you were born. How do you remember like early childhood? Like what was the context in which you remember like those earliest memories? I was about three when, when my earliest memories start kicking in and my parents at the time were four square denomination missionaries. Um, that's a little bit, it is denominational and it's from, it ultimately has its roots in Pentecostalism. And so when I was little, like uh, I remember after my parents finished their mission work in Asia, 
we moved to Rockford, Illinois, which is where I consider myself having grown up because that's where I spent most of my childhood years. My dad was a pastor then at the Foursquare Church. We didn't go non-denominational slash unofficially vineyard until, um, yeah, until a couple years after that. So my earliest, earliest memories were actually pretty structured compared to where uh, my life ended up going, um, which which I can get to. But yeah, I remember, um, I remember. I remember one of uh, the fir- very first play I ever acted in was actually an Easter Sunday play. And my dad was Jesus. And I was a little palm girl singing Hosanna in the highest, walking down the aisle. And then I remember being extremely alarmed when I saw these Roman soldiers whipping my dad. And they had, I didn't know it then, but they had magic marker, like red magic marker to leave red stripes on him. But I just thought like, they're actually hurting my dad. <laughs> and I remember after the play, uh, I was very distraught. I remember my dad soothing me. And I remember the, the, the soldiers coming over being like, oh, it's just make believe. It's fine. Like, we're, we're, it's all fine. But I was just so disturbed that um, by, by the whole thing, you know, Jesus' death and resurrection, I was confused. So my, my earliest memories of um, the Christianity that I was born into were just very confusing. It was all very intense and very confusing. Um, and it would remain confusing and get even more confusing as I got older. Um, the more I felt like I understood, the more questions I had. And I'm, I'm sure many of us can relate to that. <laughs> well, I, I really resonate. You said something on a little bit culty, um, that I really liked. And you said there was no room for self kind of growing up. It felt like you were kind of this battleground for there's God and there's Satan. And every voice going through your head is, is coming from one of those two angles. And I really relate to that experience of constantly feeling like, is this me? Is this right? Is this wrong? And you're even the most minute things that don't seem to matter at all have these super heavy (laughs) spiritual meaning to them. And it certainly doesn't help when your parents are in this ministry capacity where you're seeing them have this weight on top of everything that they're doing. Um, so your, your family obviously was kind of trying to find their spiritual identity. And you can kind of see that in the background of your story is them shifting, changing denominations to being non-denominational, to trying to discover what the truth is. And this leads to them essentially deciding we need to give up all our belongings and really just go out on what they call this grand adventure. Um, Around what age were you when that happened? And what was going through your mind as your parents are saying, hey, we're going to give up all the cushy things that we enjoy now and without any plan, sell our house and go drive around and hope we find something maybe? Yep, that's that's a way to put it for sure. It's not inaccurate. Um, so I was, let's see, that all happened around my junior high years. So, um, and it was a little bit staggered. So when I was 11, um, my dad at the time believed that God was calling him to give up worldly employment and trust on God exclusively to provide. And um, a little background context here for your listenership. Uh, my parents by then had gotten very heavily involved in the spiritual revival movement known as the Toronto Blessing. And that was like very holy roller, casting out demons, performing miracles, praying in tongues, having visions. It was a very demonstrative, emotive um, almost psychedelic experience of faith. Um, I now call it those types of things soberly induced mystical experiences. They're not unlike the experiences that one can have if they take psilocybin, for instance. But when you just enter it through a state of fasting, prayer, chanting, singing, um, yeah, it's it's a mystical experience. And I come to see all revivals share a lot of common traits across religions. But my parents were so heavily impressed by their own personal uh experiences with God in this revival setting, they genuinely believed that God was calling us um, gradually, bit by bit, to give up worldly employment, to give up our home, our belongings. Um, there's all these verses in the Bible that that back that up. Jesus says, you know, like, sell everything you can and come follow me. Um, and, you know, look at the birds of the air. They don't worry about where they're going to live, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them and takes care of them. How much more precious are you than these birds? And so, um, I remember there were these certain verses that really stood out and impacted my parents and led them to the decisions that that they made. And I'm the oldest of five kids. We were all homeschooled, Christian curriculum, of course. Um, and I 
yeah, I was 11 when my dad gave up employment. When we started to travel, we uh, rented out our house in Illinois to some friends. My parents presented it at the time as a camping trip to California. And usually our camping trips lasted about a week, maybe two. We were gone a whole year. <laughs> and during that time, we lived in, uh, in our tent in people's backyards. A woman felt God put it on our heart to give us a trailer. So we lived in a trailer in the driveway. Um, another family said, oh, you know, God led us to invite you to live in our driveway. So we lived in driveways and yards and campgrounds for about a year in California. Came back to Illinois just for a few months, and that's when we sold the house. And then we really were um, technically homeless, and we really started traveling a lot more all across North America, from the South, up the East Coast to Canada. Um, and yeah, during that time, let's see, by then, that was my 13th year. Um, and that was when we did the most moving around. And, and we visited a lot of different churches um, in the, the different places that we traveled to. And we would meet random people in campgrounds who, again, would use the verbiage of, oh, God put it on my heart to invite you guys to come visit us and stay for a while. And that was nice because then we got to shower, use real flush toilets, things like that. Um, otherwise, it was pretty rustic. Um, oftentimes, just pit toilets, wouldn't shower for days, sometimes like uh, a week or two at a time. So I, I didn't mind when God um, let us stay in people's homes, but I was also really shy. And that's, you know, I was 13. It's a turbulent age for any kid. And I was still getting used to my body changes. I was still getting used to managing my period on the road and it was unpredictable. And I write about that kind of stuff pretty candidly in my book, but, but yeah, long story short, we eventually settled in, um, Kansas city, Missouri. And that's where, uh, the more vineyard Pentecostal non-denominational, uh, section of our spiritual journey became a lot more, at least for me, belonging in their youth group, a lot more political, a lot more uh, what today would be known as classically evangelical, like, um, you know, giving, praying for God to bring America back to him again. And um, that, yeah, very, very what the MAGA crowd, the evangelical MAGA crowd today champions, I would have been right there with them in DC and protesting and, and all that. So I, I'm, I deeply understand where they're coming from because that was me. <laughs> I was a little spiritual warrior. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's something that I really appreciate is that, and I think even in the introduction of your book, you talk about like subjective experience, you know, so you're telling your story. Mm -hmm. And so I, I appreciate that you have empathy and hold space for people who are at any part of that experience, like even your parents, I think the way that you write about them is honest and you're, you are brutally honest in your book about a variety of topics, <laughs> but you're also empathetic to what they're thinking and what they're trying to do. And, you know, I, I, I think it makes it harder to discuss these things when you realize like they were genuinely trying to figure something out. Like, it seems like it was coming from a place of, true spiritual pilgrimage to go like, we're going to find something if we go out and do this influenced by men who, you know, like a Rodney hard Brown that I don't necessarily think come from as genuine a place. And so I think there's a interesting kind of study there of like someone who's really manipulative, influencing people who are being manipulated to live a life that looks very, very different. And, um, you know, you mentioned coming of age in this kind of strange experience, going to campground to campground, then settling into what looks like in the book is like, oh, this is the end of the really harrowing stuff. Now we're going to get kind of a normal experience. And your experiences with YWAM are, are just very shocking too. Like, how do you even reconcile growing up, not having a baseline, like here's what normal should be, you know, here's what the normal experience should be. Like, how do you measure any experience? Like what was your measuring stick for what is a normal thing to experience and what isn't? Hmm. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I'm not, I definitely know that as a kid, I craved normal. And during those, certainly when I was 13 and my journals, that word comes up a lot, like normal. I just mm. want a normal life. To me, normal just meant stable. 
I just want stability. I just want to be in one place. I want to have the same set of friends. I want to sleep in the same bed. I want to flush the same toilet. I want to have a routine. To me, normal, a a normal life would just be a stable life. It's not always being the new kid at church. It's not always having your nervous system on alert because you're acclimating to new surroundings and new sounds at night, new smells at someone's home. Um, So, but that, that nomadism was my normal. And I remember, um, you know, that some cheesy, unhelpful quote, like the only thing that's constant is change. I remember people would tell me things like that about God. Like the only thing that you can depend on God for is that God um, is unpredictable and like he, who can know his ways. And yet at the same time, I'm being told from the Bible itself, because I was actually, I was a really good Christian and I read my Bible (laughs) and it would say, God mm-hmm. doesn't change. Yep. And I'm like, okay, but he he's not part and seas anymore. He's not demanding blood sacrifice anymore. Seems like he changes his mind about a few things. And and so again, it just added to my confusion. Mm-hmm. And um I think for me, the best way that I could get glimpses of what I thought normal was was just looking at the friends that I had in church, but all of their experiences varied too. Like me and my siblings were not the only homeschool kids in church. There were plenty sure. of homeschoolers. But then in other places that we would travel to, homeschooling was less popular in other churches. And the kids there went to Christian schools and some went to public schools. And they had a higher calling because they had to like be public about their faith and go to see you at the poll type things. I remember in youth groups, youth pastors were always saying to us, like, not to be ashamed of your faith and, you know, do like live loud for God and burn on fire for Jesus and all of these things. Um, and I remember being feeling mixed feelings about that. Cause on the one hand I was secretly relieved that I didn't have to yeah. go to school. So I didn't have to like be a living example 24 seven to people who did not believe it. The missionary part, the evangelizing part always felt really uncomfortable to me, partly because I'm, I'm pretty introverted and back then certainly shy, but also because it just felt pushy. But then the other part of me felt like I was being a bad Christian because I wasn't witnessing enough. And like, I would pray for God to put me in positions where I could be a witness to him. And no. like, whether that meant take rides on the public bus to dance class um, or sitting in the doctor's office, you know, like I would look for these little opportunities and I had chickened out most of the time, you know, from, from doing any official witnessing. But, um, but yeah, like normal, normal was what, it was simply stability. That was a really long way of answering your question. <laughs> in a nutshell, a normal life would have just been a stable. No, I, I, I asked that because I've been fascinated by the question because um, I've had a couple people that have asked me that because I grew up very sheltered. I grew up literally from the time I was born to the time I graduated high school. I went to school on the same campus. I went to, so it's like over stability. I was all in the same spot, the same little couple acres spot for my entire childhood and, and up through adulthood. And, you know, so, you know, someone asked me like, how did you identify anything was wrong? If you only have this experience, like you have nothing to weigh things against. And so I'm always interested talking to people about that because, you know, there's always something that triggers a, oh, this isn't quite right. And Mm -hmm. it seemed like in your story, Yes, craving stability, but also it seems like as much as you believed, there was always that part of you that felt like, oh, it's not getting what these people around me are getting. And that's a part of your story that I I relate to. You know, I was super, super bought in, but then there were those little questions here and there that just, this isn't bothering anybody but me. (laughs) Like, why is this not a, a big, a big, shining question mark for everyone around me. Um, I'm curious for someone craving stability, did you look to religion as your point of stability? Like, did you look at the black and white answers of the Bible as like your safety net as far as everything else moving? And that was something that like, okay, well, at least I can follow these rules. Or like, was it something else that you kind of clung to as a stability point? I definitely did not look to God as any source of stability because it was God who was constantly uprooting. He's rocking the boat. Yeah. 
Yeah. And the churches, you know, it's interesting because I was talking with a, a girlfriend recently who said that for her, she grew up in a very unstable home, an unstable family life. And so for her, God and church, the rhythms and routines and rituals um, was her stability. And I'm like, for me, all God was was chaos. God mm. made people cry and bark like dogs. God made people fall to the floor and shake like uncontrollably. God made us have to move again and again and again. God brought people into my life and God took me from their life constantly. So mm. I don't think of God as any source of stability at all for, for myself. Mm. Um, I can intellectually understand how in certain expressions of Christianity, like Catholicism, which is very ritualized and other mm. Protestant denominations where it's just a little bit more humdrum routine, I can see the appeal of that. And I can see how even churches aside, one's own personal understanding of the Bible can offer a lot of stability and comfort. But that was not, it was not my experience. Um, I think where I turned for stability I don't think I ever, I, it was in fantasy. It was an escape. It was dreaming of the day that I would be 18 years old and I wouldn't have to do, I wouldn't have to follow my parents' interpretations of God anymore. Mm. Um, my stability was my, my fantasy life. It was my journaling. It was my books. It was CDs. It was es escapism. That was where I found a sense of calm and a sense of hope. Uh, something to look forward to because I didn't, I didn't have anything in my life um, that ever stayed the same. Even my clothes changed because I kept growing, you know, as, as a kid. So um, I had, I don't know, I had a blanket uh, that I called key lime because it was key lime colored. Um, and that was a, a consistent thing, but I didn't really have, I didn't even have much in the way of consistent personal belongings. So uh -huh. Um, yeah, I, I would, that's it. I guess I would say escapism and fantasy was my, that was where I found refuge and a sense of calm amid mm -hmm. all of this other chaos that God was causing. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. No, there's, there's so much, um, I was reading Amanda Montel's book like two years ago and she mm -hmm. talks about like the vocabulary of cults and mm -hmm. I, I never really, yeah, yeah, it's so, so good. And, um, I had never realized how many thought terminating cliches first, I didn't even know that was a thing. And then once I knew it was a thing, I started replaying all these conversations from youth conferences, from sermons, from one-on-one -on -one conversations and like how often, not only in conversation with people, but just throughout the Bible, <laughs> there's these verses that people point to, like you mentioned, like you know, his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Like God works in mysterious ways. Like yeah. all Lean things not work on together for good. Right. Yeah. And so you're constantly shutting down the things that you're wanting or needing or desiring or just yeah. feeling in service of this greater good, you know, and, et and not even just greater good in like the next few months, like eternal good. Like this is something yeah. you'll probably not understand until you're in heaven, which Yep. Feels <laughs> very, very interesting. Um, it sure for, does. <laughs> for you, your brain seems to operate at a level where you're constantly asking these questions, like from an early age, like you're, you're working through these kinds of things in your head, but also holding to the belief system because it's foundational to how you were raised. Like, you're believing that there's hell and you have the fear associated with that, but you're also questioning like, how could this be the case? And so these two things seem to be at war inside you throughout, especially early childhood. Um, talk to me a little bit about like, once you're settling down into kind of the more Pentecostal world, you're doing YWAM, you're doing, you know, all these different activities that are training you to be a good Christian soldier. Like, were you just having to silence that kind of objective part of you that's being critical and thinking in service of this? Or was it something where you're constantly just internal dialogue all the time, all the time? So oof, a little bit of both. Um, by the time I did a YWAM summer youth group mission trip to India, I was 15. My family was living in Colorado at that point. 
um, which similar to Kansas City was also very um, classically evangelical in today's sure. uh, interpretation. And, um, you know, by that, by the time I was in my mid teens, I was really good at suppressing thoughts and that the whole like, oh, here's a doubtful thought behind me, Satan, like just like a reflex of like, cannot question, cannot doubt, you know, if you doubt, if you deny Jesus, he'll deny you um, sort of thing. So it was, it was, um, I was very good at that muscle and it's like a brain muscle of just, it's a, hmm. it's an internal reflex to just shut down thoughts of dissent or challenge or rebellion, spirit of rebellion, um, yep. which I certainly had that demon, um, but I was good at keeping it at bay because I was so terrified of hell. And I think I lived in so much fear all the time that that fear kept me in check. It kept me in my place. And um, I think that there, I can definitely think of times where I could not um, so easily just knock a thought to the back corners of hmm. my dark, twisted mind. Like I remember um, the, the concept of suffering and why if God was all powerful, why he allowed suffering to happen troubled me from yeah a very very early age and i i justified it and i think i for probably a few years i didn't really think about it that much but i remember in my, i was in my teens when a friend confided in me that she'd been um, sexually abused by her dad mm. and uh and i remember sitting there i was about 15 or 16 and a, I was just humanly moved by her story and feeling overwhelmed with um, anger and compassion on her behalf. But then she said how she found so much comfort in God through it because she realized that she wasn't alone. Her heavenly father had been there with her the whole time through her dad's abuse and loved her unconditionally. And she wasn't dirty. God, God loved her. And I was just sitting there almost shaking, thinking, how can anyone believe in this God who sat there and watched your father sexually molest you and did yeah. nothing? And you're supposed to find comfort because he was watching? Perverted, A. B, like, what the, like, I remember that one shook me for days. And it was like, I, I didn't know how to reconcile it. And I just, I eventually did the cop out that I think most people of faith resort to, which is that God works in mysterious ways and mm. we don't get to know. And maybe one day when we're, up in heaven with him, he'll he'll answer us, or we won't even care anymore because we're so blissed out in, in love and you know being united with him. I don't know, but like certainly things like that, it's always been and continues to be suffering that it completely invalidates the idea of an all loving, all powerful being who gives a shit about us. So I, I just don't observe. I just think if that were the case, the world would just look differently. So I just don't observe evidence for that. And I, I am no longer able to muster up faith. I don't know how many brain cells I burned trying, but I can't do it anymore. And I'm, I refuse to, and I'm way happier now as atheist um, than sure. I ever was even just as a spiritual person, because a lot of spiritual ideologies outside of Christianity and other traditional religions still have their own stop thought stopping cliches and yeah. you know go to trite isms to basically cover up the fact that we don't know yeah. we just don't know and it fucking sucks yeah i mean that that's why i asked about the stability of the black and white because one of the things i, I you know i've been kicking i'm constantly and i relate just in the way you were writing i was like i feel like i think in a lot of the same ways where it's i can't i cannot shut it off to be in a, you know, we, I was at a retreat recently and we did a, um, like a group, like meditation. This sounds very culty, <laughs> but, <laughs> but we did like a 10 minute meditation, which I think there's value for a lot of people doing that. But like the minute it was like, sit still, take a deep breath. I like, I felt like my skin was on fire. I was like, I cannot stop. Like, it's like, e like empty your mind. I was like, I cannot do that. I just can't, there's no way for that to happen. And, um, but one of the things I've constantly been thinking about is black and white religious belief, at least the way in which I was raised, there was either an answer, like there was an answer for everything. It was either yes or no, 
or you don't know, so don't do it in case it's a no. And there's so much comfort in that in terms of relationships, parenting, like fill in the blank. And for me, you know, at growing up Christian, I always looked at people who left it and said like, oh, they picked the easy thing because they just want to sin, you know, like they just wanted to do things that you're taught not to do in the church. And I realize now on the other side, like it's a lot harder in the gray because you have to figure out all of these value systems. You don't have a manual that tells you the yes and no. And, Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's just a really interesting, like change in perspective to go, okay, there's not an answer for everything. And now what do we do with that? (laughs) You know, and it's, Mm -hmm. it's, it's a, it's a tricky spot to be in, you know? And I, I, yeah, I, I just resonate with a lot of what you just said, because there is, you know, it's stuck with me and I have listeners to the show who are still believers. And, and I understand, like, again, I understand there's, there's value. And I would say now, like there's an evolutionary value to some of these systems to certain people, but, mm-hmm. but I just can't, you know, I, I, I trip over the same question of, you know, if there is a all powerful being, who's all good and he's allowing really hor- horrific things to happen, he's not all good or he's limited his ability to stop them. So yeah. he's not like those age old yeah. questions that people kick around and it's, um, yeah, it's a lot harder being on the other side of that. Um, for it is, yeah. I, I was gonna say for you, do you feel like? Because it sounds like in your book, it sounds like you came to the realization like I don't believe this fairly quickly. Like I know there was a lot of thought, but it seems like there was a defining moment where you go like, okay, there clearly isn't, and then it seems like after that, there's like this almost like a salvation experience of in reverse where it's like, okay, now I have this piece that it's not this, like, did it feel in the moment? Like it was a faucet going from on to off or was it a lot more complicated and gruesome kind of navigating those final steps away from that? Gosh, I'd say, I'd say that initially it was a very faucet on off thing. Um, it was just like, oh, like this is, I think I, I think I wavered for a number of years. Um, I definitely wavered for a number of years when I was 17. Um, this kind of gets into the purity culture, bit a little, but I found myself betrothed to a guy that I didn't, um, that I didn't love. And that completely shook the type of Christianity that I'd been so desperately trying to practice. Um, because kind of tying back to your early, earlier question about the, the black and white, was there a sense of stability for me in that? I would say that as I got older, I really tried to make there be, I was a more, and still am a very literal thinking person. It's hard for metaphors just go right over my head and I'm not, I'm not good with symbolism and, um, reading between lines. And so I think I, um, which was not how my parents raised me at all, but I think I liked, I wanted the Bible to be more, clear and literal, but simultaneously I've been taught the spirit moves, you know, non-linearly and God is not black and white. And, and like, so it was, it was again, just adding to the overall confusion that I, that was my experience Hmm. within Christianity. So I think that I was, by the time I was in my late teens, I was really trying to make things more black and white. And like, oh, if I obey the dictates of purity culture, for instance, then X will happen. Um, black and white, you know, and I did. I held up my end of the bargain. I dressed modestly. I prayed for my future husband. I said no to prom invitations and dates. Like I didn't, I was so good. And then, um, and then when it was revealed that my future husband, who I've been waiting for, was this guy that I did not feel any romantic feelings for at all, I felt so betrayed by God that that really yanked the rug out from under me. And I would say for the next three and a half, four years until I was 21, I was a, I was um, what I would now call dis- describe as like a progressive Christian or a Christian light, <laughs> like no. a more definitely still a Christian because I was just too scared of hell to be anything else. Um, but I became a more sex positive Christian, an LGBTQ affirming Christian, um, one who I didn't even like using the word Christian. I called myself a follower of Christ because it, I just didn't want to be associated with the type of Christianity that I'd grown up in. 
Um, but then I became where it became a much more faucet on off switch for me was I was so there just got to be a point where I was so tired of living in doubt and fear of because living in the gray area is a lot more challenging as, as you said, because you, you have to take responsibility. If you're just obeying the rules, there's a, I'm, I don't have to take as much responsibility as what the rules said. But if you're actually desiring that personal relationship with God and you believe in the Holy Spirit and that he's moving through you and, or that the devil is using you and your heart is like his, his trampling grounds. And it's like, that's the part where I got the feeling like I don't exist. I actually don't exist. I'm either a soldier for God or I'm a pawn of Satan and I'm supposed to be having free will um, because God will let me suffer the consequences of my actions. But at the same time, God already knows what I'm going to do because he made me. And so it was just, just mind fuck after mind. Fuck. Yeah. And I got to make your eyes point. cross real quick. Ooh, <laughs> <laughs> truly, <laughs> truly. And I lived like that for those years of my late teens and early twenties. And I had such bad anxiety attacks. I would forget where I was driving sometimes and pull over on the side of the interstate in Los Angeles, just hyperventilating and sobbing because like, I'm, mm. I was just, my brain was not working well. I was not mentally well living in that state of fear and doubt all the time. And I disobeyed God by not marrying the man I was supposed to. I disobeyed God by having sex with someone I wasn't supposed to. So I was just constantly living in fear of God's consequences that he did not make, but he would allow, even though he could stop it. So it was just constant. I was just waiting for the other shoe to drop and mm. I got tired of waiting. And so I gave God a test and I write about it in my book and he failed. Um, and from that point on, I could move forward. I wouldn't say entirely in peace because the, sure. the effects of religious trauma syndrome hit me really hard shortly thereafter, which now I view was a necessary uh, happening that led to me being healthy in the long run. But at the time, yeah, the faucet turned off. It was like, okay, God, you're really not there. And now I'm just talking to an imaginary friend. You know, this is like, yeah. wow, what a trip. And I would catch myself praying just out of habit and be like, oh yeah, no one's listening. Like, huh. And it just felt really strange and surreal for the beginning. Then it felt really liberating. Cause then I was like, if God's not real, Jeez, I can wear whatever I want. I can listen to whatever I want. I can read whatever books I want. And I, I felt so much joy, so much joy in being able to be like, I get to discover who I am and what I like and what I don't like. And I don't have to live in fear anymore. But I underestimated that 21 years of indoctrination, including self-indoctrination, um, I they, they, you know, they don't just leave your body. It doesn't, it does that programming, (laughs) that (laughs) that fear of hell, that, that constant, when when your mind, like, cause I'm, it sounds like you were born into it too, or that you were raised in Christianity from a young age. When, when your mind developed within that, it's, it's uh, in the, as I'm sure, you know, in the cult survivor community, there's like first generation cult members, second generation Mm -hmm. I like that distinction because it is so different because the way the brain, the child brain develops in that world is going to be different than someone who finds Jesus at age 22 with a mostly developed brain and filters out. So for me, I felt like I was born again (laughs) Um, when I, in leaving Christianity, that was when I feel like I was actually born. And that was when, for the first time ever, I could actually feel what peace felt like, what love was. And it was people, it was human. It was not spiritual or metaphysical or universal at all. It was like, I feel most loved when my friend brings me over chicken soup because I'm sick. You know, like I feel loved when my cat comes up to me for a cuddle, you know, like in the other beings too. But like, I never felt love from this this thing that's supposed to be everywhere um, that goes by the name love. But for me, it was only suffering, confusion and pain. So um I, I appreciate that God is love to very many people and that without faith, they would not know how to function. And I, mm. I agree with you. I do think there's a very strong evolutionary value to faith. And I think that's why more humans have it than not. I think it's an anomaly to, to not be capable of faith. Um, but that's, that's what my personal research has led me to conclude for now. And I'm always learning. Yeah. Um, right. But yeah, I, so I, I value that for, for people. But 
what's just disappointing is that when they think that they have the truth and that because it's true for them, it should be true for all. That's where like, I'm just, I'm, I'm so sorry, but I don't agree. If that were true, we would all be believe in the same religion. So there's no evidence. For <laughs> right. Yeah. That That's the, I mean, you even look at our backgrounds. Like I was born and raised being taught that the religion that you grew up in was heretical and off, you know, and then you were taught that these groups were. And so like, you start going like, God's not the God of confusion, you know, but we're, uh, we're all pretty confused, you know, and it's, it is, it's something that's, um, you know, it, it, I, I, I relate a lot. I am very much an, I don't even know what to label myself and labels usually aren't helpful, but I, I would say I'm, I'm a much more, I can live in the poetic realm a little bit and I can love the mystery of some of these things. And I'm not, you know, I would say I'm analytical, but I'm not a, you know, like I can get lost in the sauce on some of this stuff, like in, in real ways. And, but I will say like, I resonate a lot with the moment that I kind of hit that breaking point of going, yeah, this just isn't it. it like, this is not it. <laughs> I don't know what it is. There's probably some cosmic something here that maybe, but it felt for me the closest to a conversion experience of anything mm-hmm. I can describe in terms of the amount of pressure, shame, frustration that was immediately gone in that moment. Of course, you have to deal mm-hmm. with all of the other traumatic stuff that comes back later. But in that moment of going, oh, I don't need to feel like this deep amount of just like war against myself that I constantly was feeling. And, and I don't have to reconcile some of the horrible things that just can't have a reason. Like there's things that just legitimately happen because the world is a really messed up place. And, you know, instead focus on like, what can I do to make my corner of the world better? Like it just felt like a much healthier outlook on the world itself. Um, and I really love that, that perspective of just like, taking new information, <laughs> trying to grow and develop. And, you know, again, looking at it again is like, I don't have to have this like satanic attack on me all the time. That's really just, <laughs> just really just yeah. this internal dialogue. That's not helpful. Um, I think that's yeah. really, really cool. No, I am, I am curious though. And, and um, yeah. you can cut this out if you want, but because I'm sure you've talked about it on your show before, but what was the moment for you where, like the last straw, I'm sure there were many straws, but what was like the last straw for you where you were like, this isn't it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there were many straws. It's the same way. It was, it was pain. It was like a painful several years to getting to that moment. And, um, it wasn't like the specific, I remember like the day I was thinking about it, but basically what it all came down to, to me was I had overcome in my mind with a lot of thought term and cliches, the idea that, you know, okay, bad things are going to happen in churches. Cause like a lot of people have this idea that because I cover a lot of sexual abuse stories in the church, that that's the reason why I left. And that is not true. Um, cause I understand that bad things happen. And I think the Bible gives answers for that of, you know, there's going to be false teachers. There's, you know, wolves among the lambs. Like I put it in that category, like bad things happen. The reason that I stopped believing in really any specific religion was the fact that there was no supernatural goodness within our religion that is not available somewhere else. Like there was nothing that I could point to to say, this is the Holy Spirit taking someone, transforming them into a new creature in a way that is evident beyond what you would see in. Alcoholics Anonymous with a higher power or Buddhism with meditation or Pentecostalism with, you know, like there was nothing that was uniquely like unmistakably, this is supernatural goodness. And I feel Mm -hmm. like if there was a religion that was tapped into God in the way that they all claim to be tapped into God, like there's no reason to follow one over the other, you know? And that Mm -hmm. for me was kind of the big piece. The little pieces, up until that, I mean, yes, there's a lot of things with abuse that do shake that. Yes, there's a lot of other issues. But the other piece for me, honestly, was 
this idea you're interviewing me now, but, uh, but, but the, uh, <laughs> the, the piece for me that really is just stuck in my craw was the, um, homosexuality issue, because I never understood why something that harms nobody is something that is such a vile sin. Um, and I, uh, never understood really the, um, I mean, during the Trump era, because I was still religious when he first was running and I was living in India at the time, which is an interesting connection. Oh, wow. Um, I was in India in a, in like Muslim majority areas, a lot of the trip and meeting these amazing people. And then I'm looking at the Christians back home who support us and they're posting about refugees in ways that are disgusting. They're talking about entire groups of people in ways that are just disgusting. And it's like, this is not it. Like, I don't know what this is, but this is not my Christianity. And my my faith up until like 2020 was very much an individualized faith at that point where it was like, I believe what I believe. And the kind of corporate groups and like the MAGA evangelical world was so foreign. And it felt like, it felt like just another horrible group that I was now like (laughs) in battle against, you know, it was like, it was like, I thought we're the good guys. And it feels like we're not. In fact, it seems like we might be worse (laughs) because like we're, we're preaching about Hollywood, but we've got our own Weinsteins behind the pulpits in a lot of these churches. You know, there's that kind of stuff that just really rubbed against me the wrong way. So, so am I hearing you say that it was around 2020 that you kind of decided this yeah, isn't it for me? I would say like 20. Um, yeah. I would say like Christianity as a whole was 2021. Um, that it was like, that was like the last bat, which, which really was just like, do I think there's a God? Like I was very much sure. to that point of just, but I would say like religion itself, I had started picking apart like 2017 or 2016. Like that was okay. when I was really like, okay, it's not these denominations. And then it was kind of just, then it's just hitting every weird branch on the way out of like, I'm religious or, you know, I'm, I'm religious still, but I'm not this religious or I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. I'm, I have a connection yeah. with God. Like, all those little weird things oh, that I we had relate. on the yeah. way up. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. It's a messy, it's a messy jump. But that's why I say like it's funny reading through your story where there's things that I'm like, what? Like Rodney Howard Brown stuff. I remember watching videos as a Baptist where we believe the Holy Spirit did not do things now. And we'd go like, Man, what a charlatan. That's crazy. And then but then you read some of the stuff you talk about like with Eric Ludi or with, you know, uh, the Joshua Harris stuff. And it's like, that stuff was super heavy in our world. So it's interesting, like those points of connection along the way where it's like at the end of the day, and I think it kind of proves my point that there is no supernatural thing within that group. It's like, it's just controlled dynamics spread out Mm -hmm. in all of these different groups to make people conform, which again, I think is one of the evolutionary reasons for religion is that it's an easy way to get a bunch of people on mission to do something. And, um, you know, that can be good or bad depending what the mission is. Um, I did not expect to talk about any of this, but there you go. That's what happened. I'm glad you did. No, thank you for sharing that because, um, yeah, no, like I, and I, sorry if it made you feel put on the spot or anything, but I, no, I, it's did, I was curious to know. And just in case no other guest had asked, if your listeners hadn't heard that part of your story before, then not be able to know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I mean, I've talked about it, um, here mm-hmm. and there, but it's, it's definitely interesting. And I'm sure you've had this too. Um, it's kind of, se- this will kind of segue back to you. Cause I know I brought you here to be a guest, uh, but there's the, um, it's funny because people assume why I left and they will kind of have these like straw man arguments and go, well, he left because there's a beauty and they'll start going into why. And I'm like, that's not even why <laughs> it's this thing. Um, and also like, you know, I don't talk about a lot now just because it doesn't have a lot of meaning to me at this point because I don't believe. So, it, you know, I, I, again, I want to be respectful of my audience that is still in that realm, but like, for me, it's like debating someone about a fictional book. It's like, I this has no bearing on me. So I can debate why I think, like, it was funny. I recently started getting in a little bit of a debate because I was like, well, the Bible does say this about God. 
So like your perspective doesn't even make sense. But then I was like, why am I debating <laughs> a faith system I don't hold to? It was it was a mess. But um, but I'm sure you had people do that with your story too. Like I, I was telling your story in like a broad overview to my wife before I came up and and uh she kind of smirked and I was like, I know, because I said in a in the preaching sermon context, your story is like a warning. <laughs> that we would hear growing up. It's like you start religious and you believe, and then you end up in Hollywood, you know, and you end up doing it's like, and it's, I, I started telling you this story and I was like, I was like, um, cause I told her, I said the purity culture to playboy bunny. And I was like, I don't even know if I want to bring that up. Cause I think it'll distract some people from everything else. But I told <laughs> her, I was like, it's so funny because like 10 years ago, I would have been like, that is so sad that you had a Christian upbringing and left it all behind to pursue things for yourself. And now I look at these stories and you know I read the the stories of that um the fake kidnapping thing that happened with YWAM, which people need to read the book for that whole story. But <laughs> essentially, well I'll let you give the the short version of that story, but I look at those guys I'm like that's truly horrible and you're truly harming and scarring people. Like how do you walk away from that book and go like, oh, Alice is the bad guy in this story? Like, but that would have been the sermon illustration every single yeah. sermon. I'm sure you heard stuff like that too. Yes, I am. I I am everything your pastors warned you not to be. I am the slippery slope. I am what comes out of it. Like, and and you know, it's I I just embrace that now because yeah. what they what the pastors and parents and other people get wrong is that it's not dangerous on the other side of that slippery yep. slope. You slide and it's scary while you're sliding because you've been told it's hell at the bottom. It's not. It's love. It's people. It's kindness. It's compassion. It's peace. It's self-acceptance. It's, it's you being able to live authentically. It's, it's all these beautiful things. And it's like, I thought I would land in a pit of flames and instead I've landed among the most beautiful rainbow clouds. And it's, it's like, it's it's beautiful and i know that it won't be for everyone and i'm not saying that it's not bumpy because religious trauma symptoms are can be very real not everyone goes through it but for me it was really rough it was like really really bad panic attacks and years of therapy but not everyone not everyone experiences that lucky um, them <laughs> lucky them A lucky few nice. yeah must be nice <laughs> um but but for me no and uh, just just for your listeners, the YWAM thing real quick, it was a persecution drill, a martyrdom drill that they did not tell us was a drill. They made us believe we were actually being kidnapped in the middle of the night and held at gunpoint, real guns, balaclava faces, and um, forced to confess whether or not we were Christians. And I was one of two people who said yes, that I was. Um, and so I was executed. I had to write this whole letter to my family explaining why I died. And I kept alternating between like, this can't be real, but it is way too cruel to be a prank. So it must be real. I was like crying real crocodile tears and mm -hmm. truly afraid for my life in, yeah. in that moment. And then at the end, when we realized it was just a drill um, that they did in order to inspire us to pray more for Christian missionaries who were persecuted in other parts of the world. Um, I felt so much anger and betrayal, and I also felt like, all right, well, it worked. I'm going to pray for those Christians more now. You know, the exercise worked. Now I'm like, all right, I guess I'll just give more money to Voices of the Martyrs and <laughs> like whatever other nonprofit in the Christian right. world uh, they were fundraising for. So I think, um, but yeah, like I, I don't, I, I, one thing that I would, that I'm grateful for this opportunity to express, if you don't mind, is, yeah. Um, tying, tying into your point about like, I, I am the, the warning story for many, like if, if pastors yeah. were to make a sermon about me now, it's like the way I think that they would paint me the way I would have painted me, um, would be like, see, like she's fallen into sin now. This is what happens when you leave the umbrella of God's protection. You're going to end up on Playboy. Like you're going to, you're, you're, you're just, you're going to be a harlot with no morals. You're going to let people use you and abuse you. I was far more abused in church than I ever have been outside of it. 
Um, I was far more abused in non-churchy but spiritual circles than I ever have been in atheistic circles. That's not to right. say atheists or Christians, everyone can be, can have good and bad in them and, and good and bad things can happen in any setting. But I think that what I'd like to say though, is just because I happened to find a lot of healing from the damage of purity culture through embracing my sensuality and freely ex sharing it at within my comfort zone. I also want to stress that that's not the recipe for everyone. And I think sometimes because I'm so free with living in my truth, it unfortunately gives people um, from what I've heard the message that I think that this is the only way to heal from the shame of purity right. culture is to get yourself in a bikini and do a photo shoot. No, 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 no. Please don't ever force yourself to do something that you don't want to do. That's the whole point is you don't have to do things you don't want to do anymore. And you get right. to do the things that you want. So just because my journey of healing from sexual shame and, um, and dogma uh, came out the way it did for me, um, that does not mean that I champion that is the only way for everyone to, to heal. I think it's just as powerful to, to cover up as it is to take it off. Like I, I really do because we're all, we're all, we're all different. And that's another thing that even though the message of Christianity says that God made you, each of us unique in our mother's womb and all of, all of that, there is such pressure to be the same and coming out of that into the real world, celebrating diversity of all kinds. Um, intellectual diversity is my favorite type of diversity just because I love hearing different perspectives and ideas about things. But but yeah, I, I just want to stress for anyone who's struggling to free themselves from the shame of purity culture and just for whatever reason, just cannot get comfortable in their bodies. Um, I don't think that it you have to force yourself to be overcompensating in the other dire yeah. direction. Um, I, I've met people who are lifelong atheists and still what some might describe as like prudish. It's like, no, modesty could be a personal choice. It doesn't mean you're still stuck in religion. It doesn't mean you're still... Um, stuck in a purity culture mindset, maybe you're just not a super sensual or publicly sensual person. And that is fine. That is good for you. No. You know, and I think it's always good to check ourselves and be like, wait, am I acting out of fear and programming or is this really how I feel? Like I do yeah. that all the time, you know, um, I don't know. And you should do sense. that all the time. Like, and, and I think that's, you, you said the word agency. I think that, that to me, and that's why I say like, it's so funny because it's so villainized to live outside of the religious world and whatever that looks like, you know, like mm -hmm. our paths look so different. Like my wife's expression of a lot of this stuff versus mine looks different. Like there's so many different views of that. And there's so much diversity, like you said, in personality types and things. And, but I think like, again, I go back to, it's all about agency consent. It's about being able to actually Choose it because you want to do it and not because you feel this pressure to do it. And that's where, you, when you get into corruption in whether it's Hollywood or the church, it all comes down to, again, what we talked about at the beginning of the episode, losing yourself and allowing other voices to control you. And I know we're right here at the end, but I want to ask you this question because it, it's, it's burning in my brain right now. Okay. But, yeah, and I'm in no rush, so feel feel free. <laughs> okay, great. I have 30 questions, and uh, they're all okay. burning. Um, <laughs> but I'll, I'll ask you this so you have room for it at least. But um, mm -hmm. one of the things I see happen a lot, and I think this happens with everybody to some extent. I think part of this is natural. But when you leave a high-control religious group, I've seen a lot of kids who graduate high school, and they start doing a lot of things they weren't allowed to do to spite the world that they grew up in or to spite the teaching that they were given. And again, I think some of that's natural and necessary and even in some cases, but I am saddened when I see people who are still being controlled by their past experience and everything they're doing is in reaction instead of figuring out what they want and taking action. Like, They'll drink because they weren't supposed to drink, but they don't like alcohol or they'll, you know, they'll go date this person they don't like because they know they couldn't date that type of person in that world. Like, how do you check yourself to go, Hey, I'm not living in reaction to what I was taught. 
because that's still giving them control, but I'm living true to who I am, especially when that line is so blurred for so long. Yes, that Eric, you got some good questions. <laughs> that's a good, that's a, that's a big one. <laughs> um, An easy softball to end out the episode. you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see here. I think that I think, and, and it sounds like you, this is what you were alluding to just moments before you wrapped up that question. But I do think that there's a natural, understandable, and I would argue even healthy pendulum shift where I think when you do grow up extremely, especially if you grow up extremely sheltered or within a very strict, um, narrow interpretation of, of a belief, um, I think that when you leave and all of a sudden the world is your oyster, it can be very helpful to deliberately do the things that you weren't supposed to do to cross the line in order to know where your line is. And that line's going to be different for everyone. And I think sometimes like I'm a big fan of learning the hard way. Um, and I'm a big fan of supporting other people learning the hard way because sure. I think it's the most effective way. I also like to observe and do my best to learn through observing others and like learning from their hard mistakes. But at the end of the day, if it's something that I need to find out for myself, I just consciously gave myself permission to do it. I gave myself permission. I may not, I may not actually like this, but I'm going to do this to find out because I can't sit here in the theoretical space anymore and wonder. Um, I, and I, sometimes I have crossed the line and found out like, oh, I don't think that's actually for me. Like, so for example, um, polyamory, uh, like a lot of people, when they deconstruct Christianity, they end up deconstructing the concept of monogamy. And, and for many people, it leads them to like, I'm actually poly or ethically non-monogamous in some way. For me, it was like, I, I really let myself explore and, and go there. And then I was like, oh my God, I don't think this is for me right now, at least. But that doesn't mean I'm still stuck in a fear-based Christian mindset just because this isn't for me. You know, it just, mm -hmm. there's plenty of secular people that's not for either, you know? And I think that for, for myself in my own internal compass, I weigh whether or not things are healthy for me at a certain time, judging by um, how I truly feel about them. And it, I, I'm constantly asking myself, what is my motive here? Why am I doing this? What is the outcome that I want? Like I'm, I'm always asking myself that, but no longer from a condemning fearful place. Like when I was a right. Christian, like, what's your motive here, Alice? Is it Satan or God? It's like, what do I want out of this? It's like a very curious, permissive um, place that I ask myself that now. And so um, I think, I think that uh, for, for myself, and there's actually like a Bible verse that I think Paul writes, I want to say it's in one of the Timothys, where it's like, um, ev everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Um, that verse like is one that I still can find some tr pragmatic truth in. It's like, oh, I can do anything I want, especially now that I don't believe in God um, or, or the devil. Um, but not everything's going to be good for me personally. And I think it's up to us as individuals to evaluate for ourselves what feels good for me right now. And that mm. can change. Things that didn't feel like they sat right inside me years ago now do and vice versa. So I think um, ultimately it's a very personal thing. And I think it takes a lot of self-knowing and self-acceptance. And I've been out of Christianity now for about, I want to say like 16 years or so. But certainly in the early years out of Christianity, there was a lot of rebellion and I knew I was rebelling and yeah. I let myself do it anyway, because I trusted myself that I was going to come out the other end empowered with more self-knowledge and no one can take that from me. And if it ends up being that like, I don't actually like doing X, Y, Z, well, I don't have to do it anymore, but I gave myself the permission to find out and and I'm still aware sometimes when I'm operating from a place of reactiveness or rebellion, like I think that's a very human thing, but I no longer judge it. I used to judge it as like, oh, we shouldn't do things from a place of reactiveness or rebellion. You know, it should come authentically. But what if rebellion's authentic? You sure. know, like I'm authentically choosing to rebel and cross this line 
just to find out what happens. Um, and, and I think sometimes, sometimes it, there can be sad results. Like I'm thinking of a, a friend of mine who grew up Scientologist, um, and he grew up believing all drugs and psychiatric medication and recreational drugs are bad and they're all equally bad. So he smoked weed, discovered, oh, this is not as bad at all as what people made it out to be. Let's try this. Let's try harder drugs. And, um, I think that certainly sometimes it can lead to a dangerous place. It did for him. But I also think that we owe it to ourselves on an individual level to find out for ourselves that which we desire to experience and learn about. Um, mm. thing, accepting that there will be consequences, but this time they're your consequences. Yeah. You, you chose them and they're earthly consequences, not spiritual consequences, to my view. Um, sure. And I think that there's a lot of unexpected healing in rebellion. And I do think that eventually we can level out. You know, if I, if I, let's see, I lost my faith at age 21. If I become a Playboy bunny at age 22, I might have a very different relationship to myself, my sexuality, and my body than I do now, many, many, many years later, you know. But I still did modeling, and some of it was topless, and that was rebellious. And I write about it in my book, but for me, it yeah. was sacred. It was sacred rebellion. It was intentional rebellion. Hmm. It wasn't unconscious reactiveness. It wasn't me just being like, wow, ah, well, fuck you. I'm just going to do this. It was like, I'm aware of that, that spirit of rebellion, that little demon. And I am consciously honoring that that is some truthful part of myself that I want to gift myself the permission to explore. And so it was a very intentional rebellion. It was not a reckless rebellion. To, is, that's not how yeah, it felt for me. Right. It was very full of intention. And so I think that, I don't know how, I don't know how it could be taught or explained because it's such a individual internal process yeah yeah no yeah and it, it all goes back to the individuality you know like i you mm. know it's funny you mentioned the verse i still have verses that i like i'm like yeah i really like that you know and but it just has totally like i always um i've always followed you know the verse in the multitude of counselors there's safety you know like I love the idea of learning from others and watching other people make mistakes so I could skip theirs and, you know, make my uh -huh. own and, and that sort of stuff. But they're also the caveat to that stuff is nobody has lived your life. So you can get as you can get 90% of the information you need from somebody who's almost lived exactly the same, but there's still that 1% that comes down to you and the things that you need. And, um, you know, it's, and and I think it's an ongoing process, like you mentioned, which is which is so important to remember. Um, when I when I was going through my deconstruction, to use the the word everyone wants to throw on it, you know, a lot of Christian leaders That's not would crazy say, about it either. <laughs> "Yeah, well, a lot of I I don't like it because there's this kind of um, it, it gives the impression that there's like an endpoint, and a lot of Christian leaders always say the line." Um, it's okay to deconstruct because now they have to like leverage the word and make it mean their own thing. It's okay to deconstruct. It just matters where you end up. And that really bothered me because to me, you don't end up like until you die and they put dirt over you, you haven't ended up anywhere. So mm -hmm. like the idea that at f I mean, mm. in, re in religious circles, like the idea that at five, I can pray a prayer and ask Jesus in my heart and get baptized, and I have ended up at Christianity is a really scary thing. And the idea, like, I almost laughed earlier when you said, you know, at 22, when your brain is formed, and I'm like, my brain is not fully <laughs> formed now at 28, <laughs> like, the, the idea that you can get to a point to fully understand all of the wonders and miracles of the universe and life now, and just this year that you can have that on lock. And like, I ended up here is so arrogant. And I think it like gets rid of the idea that I'm constantly going to get new information. And how do I like the most important skill I think anyone can develop is how do I process and apply new information? But fundamentalist religion doesn't teach you how to do that. It teaches you what to think the cliche, it doesn't teach you how to think. Um, and so I, 
I really, I really like discussing that process. And, and I like the way that you've approached it where, like I said, it's, it's funny because the sermon, all I could think about reading your book is the sermon illustration I would have heard about this story and how it would get painted mm-hmm. versus like the intentionality and agency throughout the story that makes it feel far more fulfilling than living in a place of chaos and arbitrary mm-hmm. decisions that really don't make sense <laughs> unless you're mm-hmm. you know, following somebody's very interesting teaching about how to live. <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. But, no, I think I think you, man. Every everything you just said, like I deeply resonate with, and I like I I've I've not come across your uh, personal definition or um, problems with the term deconstruction. But I but I agree there that there is an implied ending in the term deconstruct. It's like eventually you deconstruct until there's nothing left is what the word implies. So there's an yeah. end point, and it's like no, I think I'm just gonna be deconstructing and reconstructing and deconstructing and reconstructing probably my whole life because like you said there's they we were not taught to take in new information we were not taught critical thinking skills for me critical thinking summarizes that's the term that feels closest to to me and my usage of what you're describing of allowing new information to come in evaluating it within how it sits within you on an individual level with your body your value systems your goals um, the people in your life. And I think that um, I really celebrate that that's going to be really different for everyone. And one other thing that I'm personally dismayed by to see in a lot of um, deconstruction groups or communities is that there still seems to be a lot of um, the right and wrong way to deconstruct. Um, <laughs> if you really deconstruct Christianity, you're going to end up a far left Democrat. Otherwise, yeah. you're going to really deconstruct it and you're still stuck in fundamentalism. So there's this, uh, it's a very interesting phenomenon to observe when a lot of people are freshly out, like within the first five to 10 years, there's, like I said, I validate this as a very crucial, healthy part of, of healing and growth is mm-hmm. to like swing to the other side and rebel vote the way you never let yourself vote before stand up for the causes that you wanted to but weren't allowed to before but also give yourself permission eventually to reconsider those ideologies and those fundamentalist thinking patterns that are i think fundamentalism is a human thing i don't think religion has the it's not just in religion it's everywhere and i think it's because we're very scared we like the group think there's safety in group numbers. We like to feel like we belong. We like community. It's a very human need. And when you go against any community's um, tenets or values, you risk being alone and misunderstood and alienated. And from an evolutionary sense, you risk uh, your ability to survive. And so I think that for myself, one of the things that I continue to struggle with is just fundamentalism outside of religion. Yeah. Um, because a, I have to sort through my own religious trauma triggers that yeah. get provoked when it's like, ah, oh, you're making me feel so much fear and shame right now, just like the church did. Um, and I have to like process that and sit with it and it lessens, it does, you know, yeah. but I'm certainly not above those triggers. And, um, and I'm always looking inside myself to see where am I still, where do I still have fundamentalist thinking? Where am I still being black and white? And it doesn't have to be in how they see me, but. Mm-hmm. where can I be truthful with myself right now to the best of my ability? Um, but yeah, I think it's, I think it's important. <laughs> yeah, no, I I've said a lot on this show. Like we're all default fundamentalists. Like we all crave certainty and it is an addictive drug to be certain about everything. Um, but look, I, I appreciate you doing this. I appreciate you sticking around for a little bit longer uh, than we had originally scheduled. And I think, We'll probably need to do this again to fill in because I've got so many other things um, that could be entire episodes all to themselves. Um, but I, I love conversations like this where they end up in places I never expected um, and appreciate your book. Um, for anybody who's listening to this episode, definitely grab a copy. If you liked anything here, it's a lot more and it goes really in depth into into your story. Is there anything else you want people to connect with you on? Is there anything you want to make sure people follow, buy, um, <laughs> share, anything like that? 
Um, no, of course, I'd be honored if anyone does want to read my book. Thank you. It's called it's called Wayward, a memoir of spiritual warfare and sexual purity. Um, you can find me on Instagram at Alice Gretchen. It's just my name. All my links are there to all the things that I do and offer, including daretodoubt.org, which is a resource website I built a few years ago to help connect um, people in the be- whether you're at the beginning of doubt or you've been a closeted atheist for years, if you could use all processing your journey with say a secular therapist or a faith-friendly therapist, or you're like in a true crisis period, like fleeing honor-based violence or an arranged marriage, for example, there's organizations that exist to help you. So I built Dare to Doubt to try to make finding those resources a little bit easier. But yeah, the link to all of those things is just in the bio of my Instagram or just go to dare to doubt.org. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. And Eric, Thanks again so much for having me and for reaching out. I really, really appreciate it. It's been an absolute pleasure to chat with you. Yeah. Thanks so much.